I'm here to talk about uh, heterogeneous memory system, uh, what it is, what it means, what it is about. Uh, so it's, um, first I want to, to get a few basics, make sure that we all understand what we're talking about. Um, when you talk about computer and when you talk about programming and everything, uh, all the data structure rely on pointers. Um, it, it's either explicit or implicit, depending on the language you use. So you know, when you're using a language like C or C++, and depending how old you use C++ too, um, you can have explicit pointers, you know, pointers, and you can do pointer arithmetic, and you can do, you can work with pointer, basically. Um, and you have also other kind of languages like Python, Java, and whatnot, uh, that have implicit uh, pointers. It's either underneath from the programmer, but very still pointers. The bottom line here is really that every data structure you use um, is actually relying on pointers in one form or the others. Uh, you know, when you have a, a graph, for instance, it's gonna be a, uh, every arrow inside your graph is gonna be pointers. Um, and graph is one of the most complex uh, data structures you can think of. Um, and then you have uh, uh, other data structures that use less pointers, like tree, for instance, uh, which is a, a, a kind of a graph uh, and you know, in the tree, usually it's, uh, um, if you talk about balance tree, you usually have two children and stuff like that, so you only have two pointers uh, per node. Uh, you have other, other thing like age table, uh, it's an array of pointers. Uh, you have the usual list, obviously, um, depending if it's a double list or single list, you can have one or two pointers. Um, and array, which is uh, the simplest thing really. So pointers is what you rely on for all your data structure inside your programming language, whatever it is. In the end, there is pointers somewhere. And what are pointers, really? Uh, pointers are, are, are virtual addresses because you don't actually, uh, from your pro program point of view, you don't actually access a physical memory. You use vir virtual addresses. And virtual addresses are, are translated to physical memory uh, to the help of the CPU page table. And the CPU page table simply maps the, the the, the virtual address to physical memory. Uh, the way you allocate virtual address is usually with MMAP, um, but you know, when you're using a, a programming language like C or C++, it's gonna be malloc, it's gonna be uh, new, it's gonna be whatever the language is actually exposing to you. Um, but underneath, it's gonna be uh, using either libc or something else that does via uh, MMAP in the end, the syscall to the uh, Linux kernel. Um, <clears throat> so all memory management inside user space is really relying on, on the virtual address thing. And most of it is done by the programming languages like C++ or JavaScript or Java. Um, and there is a few interesting things to, to, to keep in mind is that at any point in time, the mapping between a virtual address and the physical memory can change. You can migrate, you can use different physical memory to back the same virtual address. Uh, there is nothing blocking you from that. It's actually quite common actually inside the list kernel for that to happen. Um, <clears throat> so all this gives us like the definition of what is an address space. An address space is a mapping between virtual address and physical memory. Um, and it's what you share among thread inside a process. Um, and it's uh, unique to a process. Uh, that's how you have uh, isolation between your process. You know, you, your process have their own address space and we don't uh, see each other's address space. Um, and so the end result is really that uh, all pointers uh, are interpreted against an address space. A pointer doesn't mean anything if you don't have a mapping between the virtual address and the physical address. So that's what pointers are about. Now, <coughs> there is an issue. Um, when you have multiple address space inside a single process, and that's what is, what you, what is the most common thing today still uh, when you use device like GPU or FPGA they have their own page table, they have their own address space. That does mean that pointers for a GPU on FPGA is not the same thing as a pointer you have on your CPU. It doesn't mean the same thing. Simply because the virtual address on your device will point to different physical memory than the one you use on your, uh, on your CPU. Um, and you know, this uh, one address space per device uh, is, is kind of becoming a bigger issue. When it was uh, um, API, like OpenGL and stuff like that, it's not much an issue because most of the time the address space is actually hidden from the application point of view, and we don't really rely on pointer, we rely on higher, higher up construct, and so we don't really see the pointer things. Um, and so nowadays with uh, compute becoming really big things, uh, you can see the address space, the GPU uh, physical address space 
uh, actually uh, tricking done inside the uh, programming uh, application to things like OpenCL or CUDA, where you actually expose the address space to the uh, application itself, so that the application becomes aware that it has a GPU address space, a CPU address space, an FPGA address space, and so on and so forth. Um, and what it means, really, is that data structure you create actually are only meaningful against one of the address space. So if you create a data structure on your GPU, that data structure can only be actually used by the GPU. You cannot use it on the CPU because the virtual pointer, all the, all the pointer inside the data structure are only meaningful for the virtual address at which you, you're actually using. Um, and what it means, it's really that sharing data structure between your CPU and your device is becoming really tedious and really complex. Uh, you need special handling, you need to use a library or you need to do really crazy things. And to give you an idea, um, this is an example of a double link list. At the top, you have the one other space, the uh, CPU thing. You know, the thing you're really used to, uh, what you expect, basically, when you add uh, an entry to the list, you just update the next pointer, the previous pointer, and <coughs> you update the, the data structure that way. But when you have two other space, let's say, for instance, a GPU, um, it's becoming much more complex. Now you need a pointer for the GPU, uh, two pointers for the GPU because it's double linked list. So you need a, a GPU prev and a GPU next pointer, and this is what becomes the, uh, uh, the same function become much more complex. And this is only with one device, one GPU. Uh, nobody, we're seeing a, a, a computer with 32 GPU. Uh, technically, you can get away with only using one address space for all the 32 GPU, but in some cases, you will have 32 different address space, so that does mean you will need to repeat that 32 times. Uh, obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's making people crazy, really. We don't want to do that. Um, it's, it's really cumbersome. Um, and, and basically, uh, having this pointer for every address space, uh, and having also to use different API, so you, know, you will have to use OpenCL, CUDA, or whatever you're using to allocate memory for each of your address space. It's really becoming really, really tedious. Uh, we see people developing library, we see people developing uh, uh, C++ class wrapper and stuff like that, and smart pointer for GPU and all that. Uh, it's a lot of investment, a lot of engineering time. Uh, it's uh, uh, really, really uh, something where we'll be wasting their time doing that. Um, and you have, so you have two ways to do that. The first one is the one I just show you. Um, you just grow the data structure to add pointers for every other space you, you care about. So if you have two other space, you, you're gonna add uh, you're gonna uh, have two pointers, one for each other space. Uh, obviously, you, you're kind of wasting memory here because you are, you are adding more field to your data structure just to, to, to be able to catch, uh, to have uh, all this, uh, this other space. Um, the other way is to duplicate the data structure on each other space. So every time you have a list, you just copy the list to the GPU other space, and that means you duplicate the list on the GPU other space. Um, and <coughs> The advantage is here is like you can uh, uh, have one set of functions that does that and you can do uh, uh, only use the extra memory only when you're actually actively using the, the data structure on your GPU. Um, but obviously the drawback is that you have to keep all the copies synchronized between each of them. And it's really, again, tedious and you're wasting memory, uh, memory bandwidth and all that. Um, so I think at this point it's pretty clear for everybody in the industry that it's really uh, very error prone, hard to maintain, hard to debug. Uh, people are, you know, are wasting time and, and spending a lot of time just trying to debug something that goes wrong because they just uh, forget to get one pointer somewhere in their data structure. And so suddenly everything goes away because they're just accessing pointers that are invalid in one address space but, but not in the other address space. So that's where I come in the, the shared virtual address space ID, really. Um, the idea is you want to share the same process address space with the device which means you want to use the CPU page table as kind of a canonical address space for everybody, every device. Um, and so that device like GPU or FPGA will use the same address space and share the same virtual address uh, uh, that will map to the same physical memory underneath. That does mean that any pointers will be valid on a GPU or on CPU and it always point to the same memory in the end because it's the same physical memory that points uh, for each virtual address. Um, and there is two ways to do that. Um, you can do it in hardware. Uh, for instance, with IOMMU and ATS PSID, and I will go over uh, what it is. And you can also do it in software uh, with uh, mirroring the CPU page table into the device page table and, and keeping both synchronized at every, every point in time. Um, 
And you can mix and match actually both solution if you want. Um, and we will see why it's actually an idea that some people are actually interested in. Uh, a point on terminology now, um, you will see SVA or SVM, uh, depending on, on where you're talking to. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. So the one is a shared virtual address and is over a shared virtual memory. Uh, it's really the same idea really uh, beyond it. It's just, uh, you know, we always uh, use different names for the same thing. So. Uh, SVA with hardware is uh, uh, using IOMMU, and you, you have uh, two things really. You have the uh, address translation service, and you have the process address space ID. The event flow is pretty simple. Uh, the device requests a virtual address translation, the ATS, against a given PSID, I guess a given process ID. Uh, the IOMMU uh, maps the PSID to a given CPU page table. Uh, the IOMMU then will walk down the CPU page table and will look up what is the physical address for the virtual address, exactly as your CPU is doing when it's walking down the page table on the CPU. Uh, it's the exact same time, often most of, on most CPU, existing CPU, it's actually the exact same um, silicon underneath that is actually used for both, for the IOMMU and the CPU. Um, then the IOMMU reply to the device, uh, giving the device a physical address um, corresponding to the virtual address that was requested at the first step and then use the device directly use the physical address uh, for any more memory access. Uh, obviously, like CPU, uh, device, implement TLB to cache any, um, any requests we've done so far, so that we don't always have to, uh, to uh, again, uh, re request the same uh, mapping between the uh, virtual address and the physical memory. We try to cache that so that we don't have to um, constantly ask the same thing to the IO memory. So this is how you do it in hardware. In software, uh, it's not that much different, really. You are uh, copying the CPU page table into the device page table, um, and then you keep uh, the CPU and device page table synchronized at all time. You don't want, uh, at any, any point in time, you don't want to have a mismatch between the two, because otherwise it means that the CPU or the GPU or FPGA will look at different data, physical data, because it's pointing to different physical memory, and it's something you want to avoid at all point. Uh, so yeah, the cornerstone is having, at, at any time, uh, at any point in time, you want to have the same virtual address point to the same physical memory. So the event flow at this time is uh, slightly the same, really. Uh, the device fault, so like the device doesn't have an entry inside its page table, so it takes a fault, um, and it goes, uh, it triggers an interrupt. The interrupt is uh, uh, taken by the device driver inside the kernel. The device driver then requests to, uh, for instance, HMM to mirror the faulting virtual address. Um, and then HMM, what, do, what HMM does is going to take a snapshot of the CPU page table. It's going to map the, the page for you uh, uh, inside the IOMMU so that the, the device can directly access the right, uh, right memory. And then the device driver will get the answer from, uh, from the uh, HMM snapshot and will populate the device page table. And then we'll resume the device so that the device can keep on doing whatever it was doing. Um, it's exactly as the CPU page fault. Uh, it just, this time, you're not trying to populate the CPU page table. You're trying to populate the device page table. So it's, Exact same thing as you see when you, do, when you take a CPU page fault, really. Um, the only uh, oops and gotcha here is that uh, you need to make sure that there is no change to the CPU page table uh, between the time you start doing the snapshot and the time you program the device page table. You want to make sure that it's always gonna be the same physical address underneath the same virtual address. Um, so what we do right now, so with HMM, it's mostly using you know, the uh, MM notifier inside the kernel. Um, and yeah, so you, you we have to constantly monitor any change to the CPU page table done by, by the Linux kernel so that we can all constantly update the device page table at the same time. A uh, bit of tedious, but it does work. So then the question becomes, you know, what is the best? You know, if, if I tell you there's two solutions, maybe there is one that is better than the others. Um, and there is pros and cons to both of them. So I just want to go over some, some of it and see why. Um, you will want to pick one or the other. Um, so we, with hardware, the uh, good thing is you only have one page table, a CPU page table. Um, and it does mean that uh, you don't waste more memory. It also means that at any point in time, you're sure that you have the same virtual address that point to the same physical address because you only have one place where that information is. Um, you also don't need to have too much code inside the kernel. Um, enabling uh, hardware, hardware solution only takes about 20 lines of code inside a driver. Um, assuming you, you, obviously you, your device needs to be able to support all this because it's all hardware. So, it, you know, it's a new PCI Express protocol or it's a new CAPI or it's a CCIX or whatnot. Um, there is um, still a couple of things that are kind of, um, kind of an issue here. Um, 
you can only access uh, a memory that is accessible by the CPU. And on some platform, you also have um, a limit on the number of uh, active PSID, act active process ID. Uh, so you know, it used to be eight process IDs and go to 16, I think though most of the platform are 256 process ID. Um, often what you do, you recycle the PSID. ID, so you know, when a process is not active actually, so you swap out the process and you associate the process with a new PSID. Um, but you know, it's still, still kind of a, can, can become a limit in some cases when you have a user with a lot of uh, process running at the same time. Um, with the uh, software solution, the good thing is that you can use actually device memory. Um, and just a, a footnote here, uh, PCI Express is not cache coherent, which means that uh, CPU access to device memory through the PCI Express bar is actually undefined inside the PCI Express uh, specification. So what happened is undefined. Um, you can access it uh, as I.O. And so it will depend on the platform and how, how I.O. is defined. And most of the time, uh, this is very loose um, how a CPU do uh, what they define inside the platform. Uh, so there is no, no standard way uh, with PCI Express. And, and I will get back to that. Um, there is no limit on the number of process. Uh, but, but the issue is that you have multiple page tables. You have the CPU page table, and you will have a page table for every single device you have. So you can have, you know, if you have 32 GPU, you're going to have 32 page table. Uh, plus the CPU one. Um, synchronization can be cumbersome. Uh, it's a lot of boilerplate code, so it's done by HMM inside the kernel. Kernel is doing most of the thing, and, and driver only has to provide a couple of callbacks so that uh, to keep things running. Uh, but you still need quite a lot of bits of driver code to um, to achieve all that. So, like I'd say at one point, you don't have. Uh, you can share the bus solution at the same time. You can mix the hardware and software solution, assuming your uh, hardware can actually do that. So you can uh, uh, have the device uh, use the uh, hardware solution for, for, uh, for the same range of virtual address. Um, and, and simply because you actually use a device page table, inside the device page table for every entry, you say use the hardware solution or use uh, the device page table entry. So it's like a flag inside the device, device page table. Um, you need hardware support for that, but, but you know, it's, uh, it's something you can do, and, it's, and a couple of devices actually can do that. Uh, whether we're going to do it or not is another question. Um, one of the nice things when you mix and match both things is that you can actually use a device memory. So you can have both, uh, you know, the, the best of both worlds, basically. Um, you can also do a few things that are kind of interesting. Uh, you can reserve some range of your virtual address space for devices only. Uh, for instance, if you have a compute application that also have Vulkan or OpenGL running on the side, you want to reserve some, some chunk of address space, virtual address space for Vulkan or, Vul or OpenGL or any other API you have that actually uh, doesn't expose address space. Um, and yeah, and you only need to, to, to populate the device page table for, uh, for virtual addresses uh, that you want to use on the device uh, when you want to use device memory. So device memory. Uh, why I'm making so much of a big deal about device memory, it's, uh, it's kind of mind-blowing. So the IAM bandwidth on device memory is 800 gigabyte. It's byte. Uh, you haven't seen nowadays, I think we just announced the next generation is going to be one terabyte. Um, and you have to, in comparison, you have to think that PCI Express free 60 lane is 30, 30 gigabyte. Um, and 60 gigabyte if you PCI Express 4. Um, so, you know, it's 10 times slower. And it's even worse than that if you look at about latency, actually latency is also a play here. Um, and, you know, when I tell you 800 gigabyte, you say, well, there is no way you're gonna actually saturate that. And it's actually very easy on GPU to, to uh, reach 80%, 90% of, uh, of your memory bandwidth without too much effort, actually really easily with a simple program without trying to do anything tricky. And people actually spend time to optimize their program on their GPU, they can actually reach a 99% of the, of the vertical bandwidth uh, really easily. So it's uh, this kind of bandwidth that you actually actively put to use on GPU and, and it really works. Um, and also, when you use device memory, obviously you are freeing the PCI Express uh, bandwidth, and you can do all the stuff in the background. You can use the PCI Express bandwidth you have to do DMA and stuff like that, you know, to do uh, janitorial tasks, basically, um, and move stuff around while the active compute is running. Uh, but there is a couple issues with the uh, device memory. Uh, first, uh, the CPU might not be able to access it at all, because you have, um, inside PCI Express, for instance, you have what they call the bar, which is a, um, a region of memory 
uh, that is actually a Windows inside, the, inside your device memory. So if your device memory is 16 gigabytes, uh, by default for a long time, uh, the bar window size was 256 megabytes. So you, know, you can only see 256 megabytes of your 16 gigabytes of memory, uh, which is really bad. Um, it's no longer so much an issue. There have been a lot of patches, a um, couple of patches upstream in the last, uh, last few months uh, to make uh, so that we can resize the bar on most platforms. It's something that does work properly. So you can actually map the 16 gigabyte or more. Uh, obviously, you kind of rely on, uh, on being a 64-bit architecture because uh, on 32-bit, you, really, uh, you don't have much space for that. Um, and the biggest issue of all is really uh, that PCI Express doesn't support cache concurrency. Like I say, if you look at the PCI Express specification, they will tell you that any atomic access or any, uh, yeah, any atomic access by CPU is actually undefined. And if you look at uh, Intel or AMD uh, platform specification, and they also say it's undefined, and we don't, we don't commit to anything, we don't say what's gonna happen, we don't, you know, we don't give you any guarantee about anything. So we just, what's gonna happen can change from one platform to the next and, and from one CPU to the next. Um, and that's a reason what you have seen lately, um, uh, things like, uh, and not, 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 only is it, uh, def not only is it written that it's undefined, the results actually are undefined. Like yeah, yeah. If, if you try I, I try, yeah. If you try a CPU, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, I try to do it, actually. So on some platform, it actually, something happens, the write goes through, but there is no atomicity at all, so there is like, so it's not atomic, but something did happen. And on other platform, actually, there was a bunch of oops, and suddenly the kernel was starting to freak out, and I don't know what exactly was happening now, so I'm like, okay, so it's probably not a good idea to do it. But yeah, it's, it's undefined and you don't want to try to define it because it's really undefined. Uh, so yeah, so that's one of the reasons you've been seeing lately uh, things like uh, OpenCAPI from IBM, uh, CCIX, uh, NVLink, XGMI, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, all these are either building on top of PCI Express or defining a new bus where you have cache currency so that the CPU can access cache currently the device memory. Uh, but you know, it's, uh, it's a long, long time in the making. Uh, it's taking a lot of time. We don't know when you're gonna actually see, except Capi, Capi is really, uh, Capi and VLink are really the two things you can buy today, but it's not really a community thing, you know, it's uh, on one platform, and so it's not, not generic to everybody. So, let's uh, go back to memory now. Uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, you can migrate memory. Um, the virtual address to physical address uh, can change over time, and it's pretty common actually on Linux, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a very common thing on Numa architecture, uh, when you actually want to, uh, try to put everything on the same node. Uh, it's also very common when you do memory reclaim or when you do uh, uh, some other stuff, uh, some other memory activity happening inside Linux scale will actually try to uh, uh, migrate a page around when you do, uh, I don't know, continuous memory relocation, or when you try to do uh, compaction, or there is many things inside Linux kernel that can actually trigger uh, a change between the virtual address and the physical address um, underneath. Um, so you can migrate virtual address from one physical memory to another physical memory. Um, and most of the time, you know, like you, you have, when you can do that, you have really two, you're, you're facing two choices. You can either do it explicitly at the application, say I want to move memory on that node, I want to move memory there and there, I want to use that kind of physical memory. And you have also the automatic thing. And you can have a mix of two, you know, it's not a, a black and white, it's, it can be a shade of, of, uh, of the two. And right now the two things, uh, the most common thing is mBind for uh, explicit memory selection on NUMA. Uh, and you can also use memory group in some way to uh, try to uh, limit the process to some kind of uh, physical memory. Um, the automatic stuff is the most common one is autonuma, obviously. Uh, it's all about CPU memory. It's all about NUMA and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> if you can move memory around, obviously, what you, what, if you do that, it's obviously because you want to uh, use the best memory for what it is you're doing. And so when, you, when you're working on some data structure on the GPU, you want to use the GPU memory because it's where you're gonna get the most performance, the most performance for the bugs. So uh, it will change over time uh, depending on what happens. So you know, if you're working on a CPU, uh, then you probably want to have your uh, memory inside the CPU memory, inside the fastest CPU memory you can have. Uh, uh, and if you're working on a device, you want to use a device memory. Um, sometimes the same data structure can be used concurrently by both CPU and device. Uh, you know, you never can, can, can tell what you know, you can do anything really. Um, so NUMA also kind of complicate things because uh, most of the time the device is actually linked to a NUMA node. So you know, the device is also, also tied, in, also played inside the NUMA node architecture topology, but I will get back to that. Um, then, <coughs> uh, 
You can also have multiple devices. So like I say, 32 GPU uh, on a node is something you're gonna see. So it's quite, kind of a lot of device. Uh, you cannot expect also to have all your application provide int and do explicit placement. Sometimes, you know, it all, all depends on how much time the programmers spend on optimizing things for your platform. Uh, if you want to do automatic placement, you know, if you want to try to do that, uh, if you not, then it does mean you have to monitor access, so you have to monitor, okay, this program is accessing that part and that device is accessing that part of the memory. So it does mean you have to actually um, uh, use resources to do that, to do that tracking. You need to use memory, CPU, hardware counters, and all that. So automatic placement is also something that um, actually takes time and resources away from your program, but it can be a, it can be a win overall. Um, and there is a couple issues also with automatic placement, like uh, lag. Uh, for instance, you know, you saw you're monitoring the access and you take time, you monitor, and you see, okay, this is accessing the device memory, the device, and so on and so forth. And you, you then you decide to make a decision, okay, I'm gonna move the memory because really, uh, it's really accessing that thing a lot, so I want to move it. But by the time you actually make that decision and move it, uh, the access pattern can change drastically and, and be completely different from, from the thing that actually uh, made you uh, make that decision. But nonetheless, I believe that we're gonna want to have uh, these two things. We're gonna want to have explicit memory placement so what, we're gonna want to have um, API for the uh, user space to be able to say, okay, I want to use that memory, I want to use that memory, and so on and so forth. But I, was, I think long term, we'll also probably want to have this kind of, uh, kind of autonomy, but also for device memory, so that you can have uh, uh, things working more, working better for applications that don't spend too much time optimizing for, for this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, bottom line, we're gonna need a new API uh, for all these kind of thing. Um, and, and sadly, it's, it's not getting any easier, really. Uh, we have all this new technology uh, popping up and piling up on, on top of that. You have the HBM, IBAN with memory for CPU. Uh, you have the main memory. Uh, you have bursting dump memory. You have uh, new memory technology uh, also down the road uh, with uh, gigantic size, but uh, a lot slower latency and a smaller bandwidth. Uh, new mile, obviously. Um, so basically, all this means that the system topology in the end it's becoming more like a network topology. You know, it's no longer you have the CPU and memory and everything is on pair. Everything has the same bandwidth and everything has the same latency and everybody is on the same, same level. No, you have a fast link, slow link, different paths and you can, you can access really, a, a, you have to think about your computer, a single computer as a network with multiple CPU or device accessing different memory and they have, uh, you know, bottleneck on some link and better link on the other way. Um, and, and things also, you have to take into things like NVLink or HDMI, which is like GPU link. And I just want to show you uh, an example of how it looks. Uh, so this is a kind of a two socket architecture with two GPU. Uh, so you know, on each socket, you have the PCI Express root bridge, and then each uh, GPU is connected to the root bridge on each socket, and you have the CPU interconnect between the two sockets. And then you have also a GPU link that links all the GPU together. So you know you can have the GPU links at uh, 400 gigabyte per second, and the PCI Express link at only 30, giga 30 gigabyte per second. So obviously, when you have a GPU working on the same thing, they want you want to use the GPU link and not use the the PCI root bridge and then CPU interconnect and go to the PCI other PCI root bridge and then go to the GPU. You want to use the GPU link instead of using the other path. So it does mean that you have you have to select which path you want to use and you want to select the best path for whatever you're doing. And you can use the other slow path for doing janitorial tasks or background things. Um, and this is a simple example. You have to think about 32 GPU and GPU connected not, not, not on par with each other, but with more complex graph actually than this one. So where are we at really? Uh, at this point, we have uh, IOMMU with ATS PSID. Uh, it's on all platform really, you can see it on ARM. Uh, AMD, Intel, Core PC. Uh, we have HMM for a software solution. Uh, we also have HMM that does allow you to use uh, device memory. Um, and you have HMM that helps you to migrate memory around. Uh, we have a few things missing, like I say. Uh, we need a new API for memory placement. Uh, MBind just doesn't get it because you cannot really support device memory with it. Uh, we need a new way to expose the system topology to your space because the system topology is becoming so much, much more complex than what it is. It's a graph now, really. Um, and a graph with links that uh, have different property. Um, and uh, yeah, you want also to allow device to access each other memory, peer-to-peer uh, -peer between device. I raised a session about that uh, later this week. Uh, and you want stuff like you automatic memory replacement. 
Uh, really, the bottom line here is that uh, we're trying to blur the, the, the boundary between the CPU and device. Uh, we want, uh, obviously, it's a trend inside the industry. You want to be able to your CPU or FPGA or whatever uh, to use it for what it's good at. So you have one part of the application that's going to use a CPU because the CPU is good for doing that thing. And for another part of the application, you're going to use a GPU on an FPGA or whatnot or, or a DSP because it's a lot faster and, and you get better performance of it. So that's pretty much it. That's the status of everything. Does um, you, the, 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 the programs that you're talking about uh, being written in user space, they're, they're using OpenCL, is it? Is there Frankly, right now, uh, I would say 90% of the industry is in CUDA, if you so talk about GPU. Is, is, is there a call in CUDA for doing, for the, to allow the programs to do explicit memory placement? Yes, but the issue with CUDA right now, um, with the public version of CUDA, uh, is uh, you have to use CUDA malloc. So you cannot use malloc or new memory, or you cannot use mmap memory. Um, if you have a, a device driver with HMM, and let's say you have HMM and CUDA, next a future version of CUDA, I don't want to, like, I'm not NVIDIA, so I don't want to talk to it, but like, at some point, the switch is basically, you switch away from CUDA malloc to malloc or mmap, and you have this new API, uh, Cisco API, that is kind of mbind. And, and replace in mine and you just do uh, bind my memory to GPU memory, bind that range of virtual address to GPU memory. But yeah, right now inside, inside CUDA or OpenCL to have, have the same thing. Inside OpenCL you can say, I want to use that memory or I want to use Vsolder memory for a range of virtual address that actually um, allocated by uh, OpenCL or CUDA depending on what, whatever you use. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to avoid the, po the situation where we're, we're constructing an API that we think is good, but is hard for user space programmers to use, it turns out in the end. So if, if there's already an API that user space programmers are using, I would like us to be able to implement that efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and so I have a patch about this uh, new mbind thing I'm going to post soon. Uh, and it's, in, it's using the best, what I believe to be the best of, uh, of uh, uh, CUDA API. Uh, so it's like a squeezed down version of the CUDA API because the B CUDA API also have a lot of, you know, you had CUDA 5, CUDA 8, CUDA, CUDA 9, CUDA 10, and so on and so forth. And every time they do slight modification and the way uh, the NVIDIA CUDA things work is kind of, um, I won't say like bad, but it's kind of, you know, they, they pile up stuff on top of each other and they don't, they don't evolve, they replace. A a APIs are hard, we all know yeah. this, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, what's your, um, I guess, software solution for virtualization? I mean, for the hardware solution, IOMMU has two levels of page tables, right? You can still use the, uh, you know, the first level bind to the uh, guest process space and then the second level to translate from the, the guest physical to the host physical, but for software solution, can you do the same? So for virtualization, again, you have the two things. So you have the ATS uh, PSID uh, that does support virtualization. So this time you have virtual P PSID. Um, and so, so that you get ATS against a virtual PSID, and the virtual PSID is then bind by the host operating system to a, a virtual uh, guest uh, page table. And you also have the software solution that you can implement directly inside the guest without having to do anything inside the host. So, so you, you, can, you can again do the same thing inside virtualization. Virtualization so doesn't two, change anything. Two level in the guest in the, for the software solution? I'm, I'm guess, guessing for the for the device page tables, you, you still build two levels in the guest? So it, it depends how, you're, so it depends how you, you pass down your, dri your device to the guest. You know, you can do PCI Express pass through to the guest. And in that, in that case, you have a real hardware device driver inside the guest. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's gonna program the device page table. Or you can do virtual device. So it does mean that the driver is actually inside the host kernel. And so you have a virtual device driver inside the guest kernel. And the virtual device driver inside the guest kernel will talk to the driver inside the host kernel to a uh, get link between the two, uh, virtio basically. Uh, and then we're gonna the host kernel device driver are gonna program things on behalf of the device guest kernel. So it really depends on on. So that's okay. I get it. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? All right. Uh, what kind of the synchronization scheme do you use for the synchronization of the page tables? Do you use 
fourth grand lacking or five grand lacking or something else. So to test uh, synchronization uh, in a software solution, uh, you know, you just basically run your program um, and constantly access the memory by the device. So you make the device access all the memory inside your process. And at the same time, you create condition that will force update to the, the process uh, page table. For instance, you set limit on the memory C group so that you say uh, this pro pro process should not use more than one gigabyte of memory. And then there will be a reclamation going on. So there will be compaction going on. So there will be invalidation. Uh, you can also uh, uh, also have sometime uh, a kernel module that I use that just basically uh, is mean to go the process. So I give you a PID and you're going to trigger migration for that process randomly uh, so that it can test against my main process and see if it keeps running and keeps doing the thing it does, uh, it's supposed to do. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's a mix and match of uh, custom made and tailor made uh, solution to test this and, uh, and using existing uh, things like memory C group or memory C group is probably the best one I use. It's really like I set a limit on the number of, of memory the process can use and I'm gonna allocate 16 gigabyte, I set the limit to one gigabyte and I constantly access memory, and then I'm going to be have uh, compaction, reclamation, swap, and all that going on, and that will change the CPU page table constantly because I'm constantly accessing different memory. Thank you. More questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Good topic. <laughs>